be able to overcome those things in our lives. This is a good time for us to be singing songs like that and for thinking about these things because today is Shabbat Shiva, uh, this Shabbat that falls between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And uh, it's the Sabbath of return, the Sabbath of repentance. It falls in this 10-day window between the two festivals, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. And it's known as the Yamim Noraim. Yamim Noraim, a term that literally means the days of awe or the, or the fearsome days. And this term, days of awe, refers to this heightened sense of awe and fear that we have of the Lord at this time. Not to be scared of the Lord, not in that fear sense, but in realizing His holiness and our need for Him. I love that word Nora in the Hebrew. We find it in the Bible when Jacob has this amazing dream. Doesn't he have amazing dreams? But this one time, he put his head on a rock as a pillar, and he had this wonderful dream of the angels of God ascending and descending on a ladder. And the Lord himself was above the ladder. And he saw a vision of the Lord. And this is what he, it says in the scriptures. Then Jacob awoke from, the, from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome, that's Norah, is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. What an incredible experience that he had. The house of God and the gate of heaven. And it was right for him to have the sense of God's awe in his life. The Lord has given us this time, these uh, days, Yamim Noraim, the days of awe, to draw near to him. But we must do so with humility. Because he is an awesome God. And I think that uh, we often lose a sense of his awesomeness and perhaps it's missing out of a lot of our worshipping communities, both within Judaism and Christianity. But on this Shabbat, uh, the Shabbat of repentance, we come to the Lord turning from our own ways and wanting to follow him and do what he calls us to do, following his ways. The Proverbs tells us, the fear of Adonai is the beginning of of wisdom. This is not an earthly wisdom. This is a heavenly wisdom that only can come from God. Wisdom from above. Yaakov, book of James, tells us. And surely we can look around the world at this time and we can see how the Lord, through all the circumstances in this world, how the Lord is calling us to repentance. All of us to repentance. So we are here. In the middle of these 10 days, they're also known as the Aseret Yamai Teshuvah, the 10 days of repentance. And the Lord is calling us closer through these Me'odim, these festivals or appointed times that we are celebrating at the moment. And so on Sunday night, we celebrated Yom Teruah, also known as, in Jewish tradition, Rosh Hashanah, head of the year. And this festival stresses the need for repentance. It stresses judgment and repentance. On Tuesday evening, we'll have, on the 10th day of the 7th month, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which stresses redemption or forgiveness. And so we see that judgment and forgiveness are actually connected together with the opportunity to repent. And that's what we uh, are doing right now. We are in this period. It's good for us, these special holidays for us to think about these things. King David said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Examine me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any offensive way within me and lead me in the way everlasting. Is your heart open to the Lord? Are you comfortable with this idea of God examining your heart? Knowing all your thoughts. 
Are you okay with this? Are you okay with God, allowing God to put his finger on anything that's offensive in your life? And you know that if he does do that, if he shows us that there's something that he, he's calling us to repent from, he only does that because he loves us. He only does that because he wants the best for us. He wants us to draw near to him. And if we repent of our sin, there is forgiveness. There is redemption. And that's what Yom Kippur is all about. So I want to do a little teaching on these two festivals that are on either side of these 10 days of repentance. On Sunday night, we celebrated Rosh Hashanah. We didn't do a lot of teaching about the festival itself. And then on Yom Kippur, we won't teach about the festival itself. We'll just go right into a time of prayer and repentance with a little bit of teaching, some practical teaching on Tuesday night too. But let's have a look at uh, what the Torah says about these festivals. First of all, reading from Leviticus 23, 1-2. Then Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Bnei Israel, the children of Israel, and tell them, These are the appointed Moadim of Adonai, which you are to proclaim to be holy convocations. My Moadim. My appointed times. So God has a calendar. And um, uh, I was thinking about this uh, while we were talking on the announcements about uh, daylight saving coming up. And I'm so glad that I have an iPhone. You only need to put your clock forward if you don't have an iPhone, but otherwise it does it for you. And God has his heavenly iPhone, I'm sure, where he puts all his appointments in, all his calendar entries. And in his calendar, there are special entries for these festivals. A special time to meet with his people, because these festivals teach us something about God. Every festival has a different aspect of God or our relationship with God. Some of the festivals are looking back at what God has done. Some festivals are looking forward at what God will do. Some, in that sense, are prophetic, because they're looking forward to future events. And so we need to remember that God says, these are my appointed times. God's appointed times. Sometimes in the scriptures, and even um, we see in, in, as people talk about them, we uh, refer to them as the feasts of Israel. Or we may refer to them as the feast of the Jews. But they are God's festivals. They don't belong to one group of people. They belong to his people. And I believe these festivals are what I would call the lost inheritance of the church because they don't realize, for most part, in the church out there, that these festivals are meant for all of us, not to be kept legalistically, but certainly as object lessons of God's redemption, object lessons of what God has done for us. And uh, most churches understand, for instance, that Passover and communion are connected, especially since we've been doing our ministry in Australia for 27 years, talking about that, so a lot more people know about these things. But they don't realize that there are other festivals. Passover is only one of the seven festivals, and they all have wonderful and equal fulfillments and significance in the Messiah. And so these appointments of God belong to all of us as we are all grafted in together into the kingdom of God. Now these festivals... You can think of them as heavenly guideposts or cosmic beacons of the universe leading us and guiding us in our relationship with God. These festivals are very lofty and grand. They're leading us to heavenly truth. Yet, on the other hand, these festivals are very earthly and mundane as well because they are actually some of them are linked with the agricultural cycle of the year the cycle of springtime harvest and in gathering of crops. And so on this level, the festivals seem to be somewhat diminished in their significance as transcendent meeting places between God and man. They become mere celebrations of the agricultural cycle. And at this level, the festivals seem to be reminders of the cycle of man's toil for food by the sweat of our brow. And yet... It's in this contrast 
between these two aspects of, this, of these festivals, the heavenly aspect and the transcendent truths that we learn, and also the earthly truths of si uh, the cycle of the agricultural uh, uh, life cycle of, of, the, of, the, of each year, that we actually see something very important about God. We see something very important about spirituality. And that is that this transcendent God of the universe loves to meet with us in the nitty gritty of everyday life. You experience God when you go about your daily work, when you're gathering up your daily bread with your hands dirty and your sleeves rolled up. In fact, there's a very strong connection uh, with the, the Hebrew words for work and worship. It's the same Hebrew word, avodah. And it comes from the root word avad, which means to serve. So avodah literally means work, worship, and service. So for instance, in the scriptures, you might hear of the avodat mishkan, that is the service or worship in the tabernacle. But then you also read about other types of work referred to with the same word, including agricultural work. So what does that teach us? It teaches us that work and worship are not so far apart as we sometimes think. They are not opposite ends of the spectrum. Our service to God or our worship of God is part of our work, and our work is part of our worship. Did you ever realize that you can actually meet with God at your workplace? God is in your workplace, in Hebraic thinking. This is the biblical way of seeing life. Rather than separating life into secular and sacred, the Hebraic mindset puts it all together and uh, doesn't separate it. All of life is worship to God. If you worship in the God of Israel, the God of the universe. Now I know this might be kind of obvious to you, but let me ask you a question. Who was leading worship today? Was it the worship team leading worship? Or was it perhaps the AV team behind the scenes and at the back over there leading worship? Well, obviously, they were both leading worship. And so there's, there's no separation between doing something that seems to be more religious and doing something that seems to be more kind of admin or, or technical. It's worship unto the Lord. Whatever you do, whatever you do unto the Lord, do it with all your heart. And it's worship unto the Lord. Are you worshiping God when you change nappies? Callum? Yes? You are worshiping God when you do that. There's something that actually changed my life uh, some years ago, many years ago. Uh, our daughter Sarah is born with very severe brain damage, as most of you know. And she was not meant to live. Uh, but at the age of five, we had returned, well, she was three when we returned back from South Africa. We were working there for five years, serving the Lord in Johannesburg. We came back, and then uh, we enrolled her in a special school up in Kew. Uh, we were living in Hawthorne. And every day I had to uh, take Sarah to school or to her special program, and then in the afternoon I'd fetch her. And I kind of felt frustrated because it seemed that this, this commitment that I had was getting in the way of me serving the Lord. It was getting in the way of me, you know, doing ministry. And uh, I was a little frustrated about that because in the previous ministry that I worked at, uh, you, you know, it was just full-on ministry work that you had to log every minute and every moment of your time in doing things like visiting people or praying for people or going to visit the sick or handing out literature on the streets and you could only log that kind of time. You couldn't log changing nappies or taking your daughter to school. And then the Lord showed me a scripture and he, he reminded me of what Yeshua said when he said, what you do to the least of my brethren you are doing unto me. And so I realized that in what I was doing for my disabled daughter was service to the Lord. It was ministry. 
and it transformed my understanding of what ministry is. We're all called to serve. We're all called to do ministry no matter what work you're doing. No matter what vocation you're in, you're all serving the Lord. You're all worshiping the Lord. You're all doing ministry. And from the very least of things, like changing nappies and doing the dishes, it's like worship unto the Lord. So next time you have to do the dishes at home, you can have a better attitude about it. It's a little bit too late. To, hopefully my kids have learned that lesson now. But that's what these feasts teach us, because they are heavenly and transcendent, yet they are earthly and mundane, everyday things of life. The Moadim of the Lord fall naturally into two main groups. We have seven festivals, plus the Shabbat, of course. But we have seven festivals, two groups. The first group is associated with the deliverance of the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. That was a foundational moment in the life of Israel. They were not really a nation until God delivered them out of Egypt and led them through the wilderness and gave them his Torah and, uh, and they came together as a people. And that was kind of a, a form, formative event. So the first four festivals are all associated with Passover, the deliverance of the Jewish people. That's the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, then the Feast of First Fruits, and then the Feast of Pentecost, or in Hebrew, Shavuot. And those four festivals are all related with the Passover event. The second group of festivals are what we are celebrating now, all fall within the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. The number seven is the month, uh, the sabbatical month. The, the number seven is the number for completion, seventh day, the Shabbat day, the seventh month, the sabbatical month. You have the uh, sabbatical year, every seven years, and every seven sabbatical years, you have the year of Jubilee, Shanat Yovel, where in the biblical times, slaves were set free, and people um, uh, were returned to their original uh, land. If you had sold your land for some reason because of debt, you received your land back. What an incredible system, the Shanat Yovel. People often ask me, and I got a question this week which I haven't answered yet, about tithing. People wonder is, you know, about tithing uh, as believers in the Messiah, do we still tithe? You know, the biblical system was so much more than tithing. So, so much more than tithing. The Israelite who worshipped God was called to incredible generosity towards others. It was tithing, yes, but there was also um, setting captives free, slaves free. There was uh, forgiving of debts, returning land. Uh, you know, there was not only the tithing, but there were other times that you gave throughout the year. So tithing is a kind of like probably the base of it all. And it, uh, does it follow into the New Testament? Well, remember that tithing was before the law was given. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. It was a principle already practice before the law came along. So this, there's so much that we learn from this system and this number seven built into the whole calendar of, the, of uh, the biblical calendar, the Jewish calendar. So we're in the month of Tishri and we have the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles. I've told you that R Rosh Hashanah, repentance. Yom Kippur, redemption. And then the Feast of Tabernacles is about Rejoicing. So let's come together on the 9th of October. It's the Erev, the eve of the Feast of Tabernacles, and be ready to rejoice. We want all of you dancing. All of you, including Dirk, must be dancing uh, up front with Louise. Um, and uh, we can all you stand in your, your uh, seat and, um, and worship the Lord with all of your heart. And so when you're forgiven for your sin, that's what you can do, rejoice. When you are set free, what do you want to do? You want to rejoice. It's like a calf being let forth from uh, the stall, just bouncing around uh, because of what God has done. That's the final feast. But let's have a look at Yom Teruah, verses 23 to 25 of Leviticus 23. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Bnei Israel, saying, In the seventh month... On the first day of the month, you ought to have a Shabbat rest. 
a memorial of blowing, a holy convocation. You are to do no regular work, and you are to present an offering made by fire to Adonai. Rosh Hashanah, so we celebrated that on uh, Sunday night, biblically known as Yom Teruah, the feast of the blowing. And why do we blow a ram's horn at Rosh Hashanah? Because it reminds us of a watershed moment in human history. Of course, there are a number of watershed moments throughout the biblical uh, story. Of course, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, that totally changed the world at that moment. But now, in this particular event, there's a man who wants to obey God. And God called him to do something terrible to kill his only son and to offer him up as a sacrifice. What a horrific command. But, Mo, uh, but Abraham trusted the Lord. We don't know exactly what he understood at that moment. Perhaps he believed that God will resurrect his son. It's uh, mentioned in Hebrews. But nevertheless, he took his son, just about to kill his son Isaac, and God stopped him and said, now I know that you, you have faith in me. I know you trust me that you're willing to sacrifice your only son. God provided a ram in the place of his son Isaac. Now Isaac was not a little boy. He was not just a little child of six or seven or eight years old. According to tradition, if you work it out, he was around 30 years old. He himself was a willing sacrifice, allowing his father to bind him upon uh, the altar with rope. Remember the question that he asked? I see the fire, Dad. I see the wood. But where's the lamb for the offering? He must have suspected something was going on. He would never have dreamt that his father was going to offer him up as a sacrifice. But God honored Abraham's faith, provided a ram. And because of that ram caught in, its thicket, in the thicket by its horns, we now blow the ram's horn for Rosh Hashanah and on important occasions in our uh, Jewish faith. And so we all can be very grateful for that ram's horn. If it wasn't for the ram's horn, Isaac would have been killed. Without Isaac, we wouldn't have Jacob. Without Jacob, we wouldn't have the 12 tribes of Jacob, the children of Israel. Without the 12 tribes, we'd not have Yeshua, who was born from the tribe of Judah. We would not have the Bible to hold in our hands today written by Jewish people, except perhaps for Luke. And so we all can be grateful for the ram's horn. So it's part of our corporate uh, history and tradition. So when I blew the ram's horn on Sunday night, my title was Baal Tekia, the master of the Tekia. There's been a couple of times lately that I've made a terrible error and I've called it the master of the teque uh, tequila. Which is not a good mistake to make. <laughs> tequila. Tequila. I mustn't even put those two words together because I'll always be making that mistake. Baal tequila is the person who blows the tequila sound. There's three sounds. Tequila, shevarim, terua, if you noticed uh, on Sunday night. Tequila, a long deep note which ends abruptly. Shevarim, three shorter notes. Then you have the Torah, which is like an alarm sound, wavering notes, like wailing of nine short, uh, nine short broken notes. Then there's the fourth, Tekir Gadola, the great Tekir blast, which is sounded at the end of proceedings, the last trumpet. The sound of the shofar had several major uses in Israel. Of course, it was the PA system in Israel in those days. How to get three million people moving, you know, through the, through the wilderness, it wasn't like, you know, a loudspeaker to say, let's all get up and let's go. They had the sound of the shofar. And so it uh, was sounded to gather the assembly, Numbers 10. It was sounded as a battle alarm, Numbers 10 as well, in, and uh, in Judges. It was sounded to announce the coronation of the king. And uh, it's, uh, it was used to lead the people. And at Rosh Hashanah, the shofar is uh, sounded to proclaim God's kingship. And this is according to Jewish tradition, but it's kind of extracted out of some, some uh, verses in the Bible to proclaim God as king. And the idea of the sound of the shofar is to wake people up to the seventh, day, uh, seventh month 
and the coming of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, to get ready for repentance. And uh, according to Jewish tradition, as I also mentioned on Sunday, the opening up of three books in heaven, Book of Life, in which all the names of the righteous people are inscribed, the Book of Death, in which the names of the wicked people are inscribed, and the Book for the in-betweeners, who have ten days to repent, and you're assumed to be part of the in-betweeners, and you have to get ready to repent of your sins, and to do good to make right with people. Good time to make right with people. Good time to reconcile with those that uh, you have a broken relationship with, a son, a daughter, a father, a mother. Go out of your way to reconcile. And, uh, and that is part of the repentance process. You, recon you don't just repent to God. You also need to repent to others who you've hurt or offended or if they offended with you, go make right with them, scriptures tell us. We'll look at that a little bit more at Yom Kippur time. But we've got 10 days. And in, uh, in the Jewish world, this is a good time to be a charity. Because if you're a Jewish charity, this is the time you'll get some good gifts of uh, people giving gifts, trying to tip the scales of judgment in their favor. Now the concept of these books of judgment are based upon some scriptures. Psalm 69, 28 says, let them, that's the wicked people, be blotted out of the book of, of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. And there's another amazing passage, which is quite an incredible moment again in history. The Israelites had worshipped the golden calf. God wanted to wipe them out because they, he was so mad with them, worshipping an idol when he, had just took, he took them out of Egypt. And they worshipped this golden calf. And God wanted to destroy the Israelites. And he said to Moses, let's make a deal. The deal that you, an offer you can't refuse. I'll make you and your descendants into a great nation. And I'll get rid of these rebellious Israelites. But Moses didn't take up the, the offer. He said, no, absolutely not. He said, but now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not... Please blot me out of the book you have written. The Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. What an incredible leadership. What an incredible sacrifice. Moses was willing to give his own life for his people. That is an incredible act of love. And of course we see that fully and completely demonstrated by the Messiah. Yeshua was not just willing to give his life for us, he actually did. Executed on the cross in a horrific, tortured way. He gave himself for us, willing to go to hell for us so that we could go to heaven. And so Moses was a great leader, pointing towards a greater Moses, a greater prophet, Yeshua the Messiah, who was willing to do the whole thing for us, give his life for us so that we would be written in the book that God has in heaven. So it looks like God is a, a heavenly bookkeeper, which is why I think Jewish people make such good accountants. <laughs> Isn't that right, Joel? Well, and Chinese people make good accountants too, I hear. And so it seems that God is this heavenly bookkeeper. And if you kept a record, if God kept a record of our sins... It'll probably be a very long list, right? If you keep your own record of sins, don't suggest it, but it'll be a long list of things that we fail in and do wrong, and uh, it'll just mount up throughout our lives. And so it tells us in Psalm 130, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. So there is forgiveness, and that's what leads us to Yom Kippur. So let's read verses 26 to 28. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation. You shall afflict yourselves, that is to deny yourselves, and uh, rabbis say fast, fast, no food or drink. For 24 hours, or at least 25 perhaps, and present a food offering to the Lord. 
and you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. It's like the time when the, the rabbi decided that he was going to go play golf on Yom Kippur in between services. And so, as he was uh, on the first hole, he was a short hole, he, he hit the ball so well that he got a hole in one. And the angel said to God, how, do you, how did you let that happen? And so God said to the angels, who's he going to tell? <laughs> Day of Atonement. <laughs> Yom Kippur in Hebrew, Day of the Covering. Kippur is a covering, covering over of sin. They provided for forgiveness. So we've been taught to repent. Now there is forgiveness. And a time for special sacrifices. It was not the best day of the year for the high priest. It was the worst day of the year for him. The day that he dreaded for months before the Day of Atonement, he probably had little butterflies churning in his stomach. Do you have, do you have a day of the year that's like that? Maybe when you have to see the auditor or someone like that. And you just don't want to do it, and it's something you dread. Why would he dread it? Well, because previous high priests had been struck down dead in their, in their duty. They'd done something wrong. Uh, and so it was a time of great fear that he would do everything required of him in the Scriptures. Make an atonement for his own sin. Make an atonement for the sins of Israel. Selecting a goat for sacrifice and a goat as a scapegoat. The Hebrew word azazel is an interesting and unusual word, and it's debated as to what it means, but some say it means to remove, azazel, to remove, to take the sins out of the camp, because the sins of Israel were confessed upon that goat. Then that goat was taken out and led out to the wilderness to die. Some say oh, to lead out onto a hill to fall down the hill. And it took the sins out of the camp. The one goat was a sacrificed goat. The other goat took the sins away. The reason that God required these sacrifices is because sin separates us from God. Sin is very serious. It's not just a little mistake that we make. It's not just a little uh, idiosyncrasy or uh, some a, a little issue that we have. Sin separates us from a holy God. God is without sin. He is holy. He cannot allow anything that is unholy in his presence. And so sin is serious. It leads to death, which is why God provided the offerings, the sacrifices in the place of the sinner. This is God's grace in the Tanakh. Instead of human beings dying for their sins, God provided a means of atonement through the animal sacrifice. God said to Moses in the Torah, for the life of the creature is in the blood. I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. The life blood of the creature had to be spilt to bring atonement for the sins of the, of the sinner. And this still applies to all of us today. This is not an ancient law that has been done away with. This is a current law that the whole Bible is based upon. A central law of the scriptures. Even in the Brit Chadashah in the New Testament, it says the same thing. In the book of Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for our sins. So there had to be the shedding of blood for our sins. But there's a problem. The problem is that there is now no temple. The temple is gone. It's been destroyed by Titus and the Roman armies in 70 AD. And as we know, later in the, uh, later centuries, the Muslims built a mosque, two mosques in fact, a shrine and a mosque on the Temple Mount. We have not been able to sacrifice at the Temple Mount or in the Temple for 2,000 years. No, uh, no altar to make sacrifices, no sacrifices that are made. Just recently, uh, you probably heard that they have successfully bred five red heifers in Texas, of all places. Um, but under rabbinic 
control and they believe that these are, they always talk about these things and say, yes, it's the right red heifer, etc. And then after a while they say, no, it's not perfect. But anyhow, some, some people say this is uh, a good and pure red heifer and they're going to sacrifice it soon, apparently. But uh, the, uh, the, the ashes of the red heifer are needed for the purification of utensils in the temple. But there is no temple. There is no altar. Jews are not allowed to sacrifice anymore. And so how can we be forgiven for our sins? Well, Judaism came up with an answer. They came up with an answer through a rabbi called Yochanan ben Zakkai. He was a rabbi that lived uh, at the time of the temple. And you know that Jerusalem was besieged by the Romans. And they were all within the city of Jerusalem in around 69, 68, 69 AD, all kept in the city of Jerusalem, besieged by the Romans. It was a terrible time that was prophesied in the book of Deuteronomy. Terrible time and tragedies for the Jewish people at that time. There was infighting going on. There's all sorts of things. Uh, food was scarce, of course. But there was a rabbi trapped in the city, Yochanan ben Zakkai. And he knew that he had to survive the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. For Judaism to survive, he knew he had to survive. And so he asked for a special uh, audience with the general at that time who was Part of, who was uh, in charge of the, of the siege, General Vespasian. And the rabbi met General Vespasian and he said to him, Oh, great emperor! And, and Vespasian said, I'm not an emperor. I'm just a general. But at that time, right then, an envoy came from Rome announcing that Vespasian had, in fact, been elected as the next emperor of Rome. So you can imagine, Vespasian liked this rabbi immediately. And so, granted him a rec his request to leave the city with a number of his uh, rabbis. And he was smuggled out of the city of Jerusalem, I believe in a coffin. And, he, and then later, in 70 AD, another general came, Titus, and he totally destroyed the city and the temple. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai survived with some rabbis, and they went to a town... On the, on the coast just uh, south of Jaffa, down uh, near Ashdod, a town called Yavne. And they became known as the rabbis of Yavne. It was the Jewish Sanhedrin put together again. And they convened this council at Yavne. And their task was to keep Judaism alive. This is the beginning of what we now have as rabbinic Judaism as opposed to biblical Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism came to the fore at this time. And they began to teach from verses like Psalm 51 verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And they began to teach that forgiveness of sin doesn't require sacrifices anymore at this particular time. Because if we come to God with a contrite heart and a broken spirit and we come to him in repentance with prayer and with good deeds, well then God will forgive us of our sins. Now the problem with this is that you never know if you've done enough repentance, prayer and good deeds to warrant forgiveness. How many times must you repent before God forgives you? Is it once or is it 50 times? How many times? Prayers must you pray before God forgives you? Well, how many good deeds must you do before God forgives you? You can't quantify it. Therefore, you never know if you're forgiven or not. And this uncertainty of forgiveness is a reality that Jewish people who do not know the Messiah have to live with every day. And even at the end of Yom Kippur, you can go down to the several shuls, 45 of them all around us here. If you're bold enough, you can stand in the, at the uh, gate you probably won't be allowed in, security there. But you've stopped at the gate and asked worshippers as they left, are you forgiven for your sins? They'll say, I hope so. I'm not sure. I've done my best. And you never know. And in fact, this uncertainty was expressed by this great rabbi, Yochanan ben Zakkai himself. Even though he formulated this new Judaism without a temple, he was never sure if he was forgiven or not. And so... It's recorded 
that when he was dying, all his disciples gathered around, and he began to weep in their midst. And they said to him, O oh, great hammer, that's what they called him, O oh, great hammer, why are you weeping? And he said to them, there are two ways before me, one leading to paradise and the other to Gehenna, and I do not know by which I shall be taken. He didn't know he was going to heaven or hell because he wasn't sure if he had warranted forgiveness. I believe there is a way to be sure of your forgiveness, and that is to follow God's way of atonement. The answer is found in Yeshua the Messiah. And when Yochanan HaMatbil was baptizing people in the Jordan River, remember his cousin Yeshua came down to be baptized in the Jordan River, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. Yeshua not only covers our sin, as in Yom Kippur, Yeshua takes away our sin as far as east is from west through his sacrifice. He was sacrificed for us. His blood was shed to bring us forgiveness. We don't need a temple anymore. People talk about the third temple being built. Well, it may very well happen, but it will not be for atonement because atonement has already been made through Yeshua the Messiah. He is our atonement. He is our temple. We don't need a high priest anymore because Yeshua is our great high priest. We don't need sacrifices anymore for he is our final sacrifice. Of course, we bring our own sacrifices of praise, of obedience, of worship, but that's not to make atonement for our sins. Yeshua is the final sacrifice for us. The greatest day of Yom Kippur happened 2,000 years ago when Yeshua died on the cross for us all. And so we can know that our sins are forgiven if we trust in Yeshua for our salvation. Yeshua says of all those who received him, the one who conquers will be thus clothed in white. I'll never blot his name out of the book of life, will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Our names are written in the book of life not because of repentance, prayer, and good deeds, and tipping the scales of judgment, but through faith in Yeshua the Messiah and God's means of atonement. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, it says in Isaiah 53. It was God's will. The Messiah came and died for our sins so that we would all, Jew and Gentile, have an atonement for our sins. He is our great high priest. And one day, he's returning. And we need to live with the reality of his return every day, realizing he could come at any moment. We've talked about this when we studied a 2 Peter. And what Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. I, we won't all be dead. But we shall all be changed. So whether you're dead or whether you're still alive when the Messiah comes, we're all going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the Tekia Gadola. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. What a moment when the perishable will be clothed with the imperishable. And as we get older, we all appreciate this verse a whole lot more. <laughs> when we're young, we think, well, we don't need a new body. But the body that we're going to get will never perish. It'll never corrupt. It'll never grow old. And we're going to exchange that for that heavenly body one day. And in the meantime, we've got a job to do. Proclaim the good news to all nations, to all peoples, and even to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that's our call in it. Bet HaMashiach, celebrate Messiah and what you are part of as we serve the Lord together. So let's pray. And we are going to celebrate the Lord's Seder. That is the feast, the bread and the wine that he has left for us as a reminder of his salvation for us. That he gave his body as a sacrifice for our sins. That he shed his blood to bring in a new covenant between God and man for Jew and Gentile alike. So we're going to have the Lord's Seder together in a moment. So let's prepare our hearts. Let's remember this time is the Amim Noraim, the days of awe. We come to a holy God 
and we give up our lives, surrender our lives to him. For he loves us, he's provided a, the means, the means of atonement for us through the Messiah. Thank you, Lord. We bless you and praise you. Let's just have a, a moment of, I was going to say a moment of silence uh, as we just contemplate what God has done for us.